We get a chance to hear directly uh, from uh, the five uh, leaders of uh, the energy hubs uh, in our country. Uh, and we're also going to have an opportunity to hear from the uh, acting secretary of the Department of Energy, uh, who uh, is uh, going to be um, talking and helping to lead us through a discussion about what the energy hubs are really uh, are achieving and what the focus of all this uh, effort is all about. So we have a $260 billion investment last year uh, in, uh, in the energy uh, innovation space uh, globally. The United States is now uh, front and center, uh, and we have, um, you know, kind of moved away from uh, kind of being spectators in this space to really being engaged. Uh, these, the energy hubs are focusing on five critical areas. Uh, one is uh, materials, uh, the other is energy innovation, uh, the whole space around reactors. This administration has, uh, for the first time in 30 years, uh, uh, launched uh, new reactors uh, to be developed. Uh, this is part of this kind of all-in strategy uh, on energy. Uh, but we also have uh, renewables, and uh, we're looking at solar. One of the hubs is looking at solar and, and, uh, and geothermal uh, and wind. Uh, so, and then, of course, uh, the battery space, which is critically important. And the president has said that whoever wins the battery race uh, is going to be able to uh, have a great deal to say about uh, industries such as the auto industry. And we know its importance in the uh, airline and other uh, industry. So uh, Aragon is here. I've been out to visit uh, more of the national labs uh, than any other member of Congress. I've seen more of the science that we are engaged in. People talk about uh, shell development, uh, but it's little known fact that the, uh, the technology uh, to go after the natural gas and oil was developed at a national lab right in Pennsylvania. Um, you know, uh, more than a decade ago. So you have to make the investment, uh, you have to in, 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 in essence seed, and then you can harvest at a later point. So now we are, have changed the entire dynamic of the United States position relative to energy in the world. Uh, so our uh, imports are down um, to the lowest level that I think any of us can uh, recall. Uh, from areas uh, around the world. In fact, we are now starting to export. Uh, and then in the natural gas space, uh, we are really positioned for the next 100 years or more uh, in a strong position. So this administration has made very significant investments, and the most important of them is in the renewable energy space, uh, because it is there that we will be able to, uh, I think, over the long term, uh, position the United States uh, uh, to be a world leader in these uh, industries. So from ARPA-E, we could go through the whole list. There's a lot that the department is doing. Today we're going to focus on these hubs, and I'm very proud that one is in Philadelphia, but I am actually proud of all of uh, the hubs and their work. Uh, I think it's critically important. And I want to introduce to you the acting secretary uh, who has gotten uh, degrees from you know, Harvard and Oxford. He served uh, uh, and the, I guess one might say uh, the entry level at the White House uh, coming in as a fellow, but also went on up through the National Security Council, has been engaged in much of our nation's efforts uh, related to uh, national security, where it intersects with energy, and also around non-proliferation non issues, which are very important uh, work that the department is engaged in uh, through NNSA. Uh, so, uh, the acting secretary is uh, here. I told him uh, privately that he could be acting for a while given the way that the upper body uh, moves through the confirmation process. Uh, but if you could uh, join me in welcoming acting secretary uh, uh, Puneman. Puneman. I get called much worse. <laughs> Puneman. Puneman. I'm going to get that right. He could have a simple name like Fatah, it'd be a lot easier. <laughs> Acting Secretary, please. Thank you, Congressman. 
Uh, on the last uh, point, uh, I, I assured the Congressman that I am doing everything in my power to work myself out of a job as quickly as possible. Uh, not that it isn't fun, but uh, we have in the President's nominee just an outstanding individual well known to many people, including myself, who've had the opportunity to work with him over the years and uh, very uh, much eager for his early confirmation by the U.S. Senate. I also want to thank you, uh, Congressman, for your leadership, for hosting us here today, uh, for the leadership uh, that you have led your community, Philadelphia, going back to the great uh, scientific origins uh, of this country with Franklin and his experiments on electricity. Still a great science town. Uh, I've enjoyed uh, going there, bringing my kids to the science uh, museum and, uh, and so forth. And, uh, and boy, you know, you just have completely embraced uh, our policy of the energy all of the above. And, if we could add maybe a sixth hub on cloning and get you propagated across the hill, we'll be doing just great. You're right, of course. You know, last year, energy investments uh, globally in new energy got up to $268 billion. And really, a lot of what we're doing here and a lot of what we're talking about this morning goes to the question, are we going to lead? Do we want to import the technology of the future? Or do we want to do what the president has called for? Do we want to out-educate, out-innovate, and out-build? You want to be importing all these technologies and equipment to build out our energy infra infrastructure, or do you want to be doing the work, making the breakthroughs, making the American jobs, getting the American prosperity, the exports to lead? I go all around the country, I ask people this question, guess what? I don't get a lot of different answers. I think it's quite clear. That's why I'm so uh, excited to be here uh, this morning. As I think most of you know here, uh, the Energy Department traces its origins all the way back to World War II in the days of the Manhattan Project, an effort that brought together the country's greatest minds without any consideration to their technical title, but just to solve the greatest problems the world faced, defeating Hitler at the time. And it only managed to succeed because of the ability of people like General Leslie Groves, like Dr. Robert Oppenheimer, to break down traditional stovepipes of academia and government and industry to harness the nation's brightest scientists, engineers, and military technicians to tackle the challenges at hand. Now, of course, our department has grown far beyond its roots and origins in the Manhattan Project. Today, we are at the forefront of the President's all of the above strategy to reduce our dependence on foreign oil, address the global climate crisis, and support the clean jobs of the future. But I can assure you that we have not forgotten the lessons that we learned back in the 1940s. To solve the nation's and indeed the world's most pressing challenges, we have to bring together the nation's top minds. In 2010, the department launched a new R&D model to accelerate breakthroughs in clean energy. These energy innovation hubs bring together researchers from a variety of fields and technical backgrounds, physicists, chemists, biologists, engineers, people from the private sector, innovators, industrialists to solve critical energy challenges. The hubs have the agility and the funding quickly to focus on what works and also very important to abandon bad ideas that don't work. Having spent four years working under Secretary Chu and hearing all the stories about Bell Labs, there's a lot to be said for uh, knowing you got, a, you got to try it. I mean, look at if anyone's had the opportunity, as I have had, to visit the Menlo Park Laboratory of Thomas Edison and see all those bottles of what he tried before he found tungsten. Uh, you got to be able to abandon the bad ideas and not spend another three years because we happen to have a grant pursuing a bad idea. Uh, those cul-de-sacs are not going to get this country where we want to be going. This is a model that has worked. It has worked repeatedly. Uh, it has worked at Bell Labs, which invented the transistor and produced seven Nobel Prize winners, including one Secretary of Energy. It worked at Lincoln Labs, which developed radar. We've already talked about the Manhattan Project. And it's going to work today as we strive to build an economy built on clean, sustainable sources of energy. So uh, I always tell my son, you can't talk and listen at the same time. And uh, you uh, have before you uh, five uh, outstanding individuals we had a, a chance to visit this morning. And I will tell you, just talking to them, hearing about their plans, hearing what they're already doing, uh, it, will, it got my juices flowing, and I'm sure it will you as well. Uh, and I'm just going to very briefly tell you uh, a little bit about each of them. And then, of course, you'll hear from them directly. 
our uh, first, the grandfather, a, a, a big old three years old, are you now? Yeah? Uh, it's uh, our, not a castle in the air, but a castle nonetheless, our nuclear simulation, modeling and simulation hub, which is using the power of supercomputers to develop virtual reactors that will teach us how to improve the safety and performance of current and future nuclear reactors. Uh, I was proud to be the selecting official for the Fuels from Sunlight Hub, which is also represented here, which is developing an economical way to convert water and carbon dioxide into fuel, effectively harnessing the power of the sun without using a drop of oil. Uh, indeed, going back to our nation's origin in the great uh, city of Philadelphia, we have the Energy Efficient Buildings Hub, working to reduce energy use in commercial buildings by the goal set forth by the President, 20% by the year 2020. That would save $60 billion that would be liberated to create new American jobs, invest in energy technology, create prosperity, and, uh, and lead this country to the place where we need to go. Uh, the recently established Batteries and Energy Storage Hub has already developed and is kind of robustly advocating uh, what uh, they are calling, uh, as of this morning at least, the 555 plan to produce batteries that have five times the energy uh, density at one-fifth the cost over five years. A truly ambitious goal, but if we are to achieve what we want to achieve in terms of the President's objective for uh, electrical vehicles everywhere, uh, grid level storage, and the uh, necessity of integrating intermittent sources of power in our grid, as we were talking this morning, it's one thing to do it, you can sort of absorb it in a large grid when you're only talking about a 2% penetration. But remember, the President has called for 30% wind by 2030. We're hoping to maybe get to 15% solar. And when you're talking about that amount of intermittent sources of energy in a grid, you're going to need a significant uh, storage capacity, one that we frankly don't have yet, but these folks are going to help us get there. Uh, and then our newest addition, and uh, one that I think is absolutely fascinating as well as important, is the Critical Materials Hub tasked with averting supply disruptions in the so-called rare earths and other critical materials that are used in wind turbines, solar panels, electric vehicles, and a wide variety of clean energy, electronic, and military applications. So look, uh, this is an experiment. We've been doing it since 2010. It's early days. We have, you know, ranging from a few months to just three years, but I can tell you we're already beginning to see uh, very impressive, very exciting results. And we're talking this morning uh, with, uh, with Doug about the nuclear energy modeling and simulation uh, and the virtual reactor code that it is uh, already delivering to our industry partners so that they can test the applications to improve the safety and operations of their reactors. The Batteries and Energy Storage Hub has only been around for five months, but researchers there have already announced a breakthrough flow battery that will smooth the fluctuations of power from renewable sources to the grid. Uh, but listen, uh, despite uh, these early stages, we know we are in a long-term sustained effort. We know that there is still a pressing need for research in other areas uh, that we're facing as a national challenge. I think many people here, uh, certainly many of us at the department, work very, very hard uh, in the days and weeks following Hurricane Sandy to restore power uh, to the 8.5 million people who were left without. And the President was very, very focused on this, and he said repeatedly that after saving life and limb, his highest priority was restoring power to the people who were in need. And that is why we have also called, and why the President has proposed for an electric uh, hub to address the challenges of the electric grid, which tie very much into the not only integration of renewable energy sources, not only in dealing with the flexible and evolving demand of the grid, whether it's through smart metering or through electrical vehicles, which depending on the time of day will be either drawing from or feeding into the grid, but also will enhance the resiliency of a very aged uh, and frankly a sclerotic grid compared to all the other elements of American infrastructure where you've seen great modernization. We need a greater resiliency uh, in our grid. Uh, that's why this hub would be so important, and we certainly hope that the Congress will support it, and perhaps with the support of people like Congressman Fatah, we will get there. But the other thing I would say is the resiliency of our grid also has to take into account 
the increasing problem of cyber threats uh, to which we are all too vulnerable. History is replete with examples of efforts that have succeeded through this kind of integrated approach to interdisciplinary tackling of really tough problems. And it has solved some of the world's greatest problems. We talked about the Manhattan Project. Well, another critical uh, problem to solve uh, in the same war was breaking the German code, the Enigma. And uh, we don't have a monopoly on these things. The Brits put together an incredible team, geniuses uh, in many cases, working out of Bletchley Park, and they broke the Enigma code, which was also instrumental to prevailing uh, over Hitler in World War II. Perhaps uh, yet another genius, Albert Einstein, said it best when he said, we can't solve problems by using the same kind of thinking we used when we created them. Bottom line, science is happening in the hubs, and the science that is happening there is going to shape our future and that for many generations yet to come. It's worked before. We're seeing it work again when it comes to developing new and exciting energy technology. And with that, uh, I would like to thank uh, again, Congressman Fatah for hosting this morning. All of you for coming out here for, I think, a very uh, important and exciting event. And uh, thank you all for coming. With that, I will turn it over to Dan Leistico to take it from here. So thank you all very much. All right, I'm, I'm Dan Leistico. I'm the Public Affairs Director at uh, Department of Energy. Um, and that's the end of my speech. I'm going to turn it over to uh, the, the, the hubs directors and um, uh, facilitate our, our, uh, our question and answers. And I also do want to mention that we are uh, live tweeting this and, I, and we want to welcome our, our online uh, audience as well. Um, so with that, um, uh, I'm going to just introduce uh, each of them to you and then uh, we'll, we'll move to some questions. Um, starting at this end, we have uh, uh, Doug Cothy, who's leading our um, nuclear modeling and simulation hub. Uh, we have Dr. Nate, Nate Lewis from the, the Fuels for, from Sunlight Hub, uh, Dr. Henry Foley from the Energy Efficient Buildings Hub, um, Dr. George Crabtree uh, from the uh, Battery and Energy Storage Hub, uh, and then Dr. Alex King from our, our Critical Materials Hub. Um, and with that, let me just start with a, with a, with a first question uh, to just give us a very short overview of what you're working on and what you hope to accomplish in the next few years. Thanks, Nate. Uh, thank, thanks, everybody, for being here again. My name is Doug Cothy from Oak Ridge National Lab, and uh, I direct uh, the first DOE Energy Innovation Hub, known as CASTLE, the Consortium for Advanced Simulation of Light, light Water Reactors. As uh, Secretary Poneman said, uh, we are three years old, so we started in uh, July 2010. Um, we consist of a consortium of, uh, of 10 core partners, uh, four DOE National Labs, three leading universities in nuclear energy, and most important, frankly, from our point of view, uh, industry. We have EPRI, uh, Electric Power Research Institute, which is the R&D arm of the, of the nuclear energy. We have Westinghouse, a fuel vendor, a fuel designer, and Tennessee Valley Authority, which is a utility or owner-operator. So from the nuclear uh, community point of view, we have the three, really the three pillars that are very important, the designers, the utilities, and the, uh, the utility side uh, R&D sector. Um, quite simply, our goal is to, uh, is to develop, apply, and deploy science-based predictive simulation tools for light water reactors. Our focus the first uh, five years, in fact, the first uh, three years is on pressurized water reactors and specifically the nuclear reactor core. And pressurized water reactors com uh, comprise about 60% of our fleet in both the U.S. and, and the world. Um, our focus is, uh, is better understanding of the operational and safety performance defining phenomena in the reactor core. And uh, our environment that we are developing is, is called VERA, the Virtual Environment for Reactor Applications. It's a living, breathing piece of software now, and um, it is being deployed to initially our, uh, our industry core partners as we speak. Um, we are uh, focused a lot on fuel performance and fuel, beha fuel behavior, which is very important for the industry, both for uh, economics, but uh, uh, performance and efficiency, and obviously safety as well. Uh, so we're uh, uh, actively working together, a public-private partnership. We're excited about what we're doing. I'd uh, love to tell you more, but in the interest of time, uh, just uh, very, very excited to be here and looking forward to answering your questions. Thank you. 
Uh, I'm Nate Lewis. I'm with JCAP, the Joint Center for Artificial Photosynthesis, which is the Fuels from Sunlight Hub. Uh, it's led by my home institution, Caltech, with a major partner, Lawrence Berkeley Labs, and some work is being done in partnership with UC Irvine, UC San Diego, and at SSRL at, at SLAC. Um, the goals of the fuels from Sunlight Hub are to take water, carbon dioxide, and the sunlight and make fuel for our cars. Pretty simple, at least in principle. Plants figured it out. A for inspiration, D minus for execution. They're pretty inefficient. Less than 1% of the sunlight that hits a square meter actually is stored in all the energy of the fastest growing crop. And they make a fuel humans can't use, this lignocellulose stuff. Uh, so since more energy from the sun hits the earth in one hour than all the energy consumed on our planet in a year, it would be great if we could take that inexhaustible clean resource and make fuel for our cars, for our airplanes, for our ships, and to give us massive storage to compensate for intermittency. So it's a grand challenge. It addresses energy security, environmental security, and national security. But we know it can be done. We know there are pieces in various laboratories uh, that already can meet our goal of making fuel more than 10 times more efficiently than the fastest growing crop. But we can't do it in a scalable way and in a way that has a robust technology. And that's the goal of the hub, is to put together pieces into systems to do things in new ways, to discover more catalysts in a day than have been discovered in human history collectively combined, to harness the power of cross-disciplinary research from physicists, chemists, material scientists, all under one roof, all working on a common goal and bringing various aspects of both science and technology together, not just to publish great papers, but to focus on a real concrete outcome to develop a technology uh, that will move the needle in terms of our ability to serve the country. And that's really what JCAP, and I think what in some version all the hubs are about in their own way of doing things. Hubs are a very exciting way of doing business and science uh, uh, we are seeing that other countries are now imitating us. There's a Korean center for artificial photosynthesis. There's a Japanese center. There's a European center. There's a Brazilian center. So again, our country is setting an example of the way to organize and do science. And we just want to maintain our leadership position in this area. Thanks. Hi, I'm Hank Foley. I'm the... Um Director, Executive Director of the EEB Hub. I'm also from Penn State University, which is the leader of this hub. Uh, I'd like to tell you what we're doing, why we're doing it, how, where, and who's doing it. So I'll go through that pretty quickly. Our overall goal is to try to reduce energy use in the building sector, particularly the commercial building sector, by 20% by 2020, as you heard. We want to do that with advanced energy retrofits. And you could ask yourself, why would you want to do that? And the answer is right now, as you all know, we use about 100 quads of energy a year, quadrillion uh, BTUs of energy. It's just incredible when you think about it. 40% of that energy is used in buildings. 50% of that, or about 20 quads, is used in commercial buildings. We have about 5 million commercial buildings. They're on the order of 50,000 square feet or so. The replacement rate is about 1% to 2% a year, maybe lower right now. If we could cut 20% by 2020 from just those buildings alone, that would amount to four quads. Uh, among friends, we'll say a quad is about 300 billion BTUs and at five, uh, sorry, kilowatt hours, and at five cents a kilowatt hour, that gives us the $60 billion that could be reinvested, uh, I think, more intelligently than simply allowing it to go out through the roof of a building. So that really drives us uh, to go forward. The how really comes down to five things that, that we've analyzed. First of all, compared to other engineered artifacts and, and the like within uh, the US and elsewhere, what we find is that engineering design is much, much uh, inhibited uh, in buildings. 
because of the fact that we don't have good models and appropriate models in simulation. Uh, this is a crucial, crucial part of that which we do in engineering. Engineering science depends on these models. Uh, if we're going to ask building owners to put their capital at risk to reduce energy usage, we have to minimize that risk. And you can't minimize that risk unless you can make predictions. And you can't make accurate predictions without good models. So modeling is number one. Number two, what we find is that components of buildings, uh, the structure of the building, the envelope, fenestration, um, glazing, HVAC systems, and so forth, roofs, have all gotten individually much more efficient over time, over the last 20 years. And yet when we combine them into a system, a system of systems, what we find is we don't retain the individual improvements in efficiency that those, those components provide. Well, why is this? It's a really good problem in engineering science, and it's a hard problem. It has to do with coupling, and it has to do with nonlinear coupling of those various systems in their performance and behavior. So again, if we can't make predictions, we can't do the modeling, we can't predict how best to couple those pieces together, then in fact we're at a disadvantage and we can't produce the kind of results we want. So demonstration in the laboratory of these effects, that is really validation of our models and simulation is crucial. Uh, going beyond that, anything we do in this field has to be legal. And there are tremendous amounts of uh, regulation, uh, policy and law, that as engineers we normally wouldn't uh, be as worried about if we're inside the fence of a chemical or petroleum refinery. There are some well-known laws you must follow. But in this area, they're even more complex. And so many of the things that we'd like to do in integrating processes and procedures that would lead to uh, better utilization of engineering uh, paradigms that we have in other fields are hard to, re hard to reproduce in this area unless we fully understand the legal constraints and policy constraints. Furthermore, if we could relax some of those constraints at times, we might get a nonlinear positive effect, a really good boost in, in efficiency. So we have a small number of people who really look at that intensely to keep us, uh, so to speak, out of trouble. The next thing is that I think as in cars, um, you know, 20 or 30 years ago, most of us drove cars with mechanical carburation, uh, points and plugs and things of that sort, uh, fuel pumps. Today, uh, when we look at a car, it, it's a very different beast. It's much more computerized, it's much more uh, tightly controlled, and the kinds of people who work on those cars are a very different kind of person than the kinds that worked on them uh, 20 or 30 years ago. So developing a workforce from JEDs or GEDs all the way to PhDs is crucial for us, and we're working on that. We're also trying to build a cadre, a community of people who will begin to define building science and engineering and begin to teach it in our universities. And lastly, we'd like to see new businesses develop in this, in this um, sector. We think it's a wonderful area for new business to develop. We see some of that already happening. We think more can happen. We do everything we can to beneficiate, to teach, and to allow that to go forward with as little inhibition as possible. So that gets to the how, the where. Uh, the where is everywhere. It's across the United States. Wherever we can save energy, uh, we want to do that. And buildings are everywhere. So in fact, it really doesn't matter where you point us. Uh, we should be able to do that which we do in Tucson, Arizona, Portland, Washington, or is it Oregon? Sorry, where is Portland? My geography was never very good, IR and engineer, I guess. Uh, Tacoma, Washington, uh, Austin, Texas, Chicago, what have you. Uh, so the where is everywhere, but one has to start someplace. And where we've chosen to start is in the Philadelphia Navy Yard, because there's a grand stock of very old, very rundown buildings, all of which will be eventually retrofitted. Uh, and we can help and assist in those retrofits. And in fact, we're doing that already in Building 661. We have a $30 million grant from the state of Pennsylvania to do that and to also create a building that will be used for instruction and in teaching in building science and uh, of like. And lastly, the who. 14 universities of all different sizes and types from uh, private Ivy League schools, Princeton and Penn, for example, uh, CMU, uh, public research universities like Penn State, Purdue, uh, and also smaller schools that include schools uh, smaller like Drexel uh, and Morgan State. We also have five corporations working with us, uh, top corporations like the uh, United Technologies Corporation, uh, Bayer Materials, 
uh, IBM and others. And we have six NGOs. NGOs uh, refer to those organizations that do things like workforce development, and they're very keenly interested on this. Uh, we can do that because in addition to the DOE funding, we have funding from other agencies as well, including EDA, SBA, and NIST, albeit much smaller in quantity, but enough for us to do quite a bit of the extra work that's required of us as an energy uh, research innovation. So, uh, cluster. Uh, sorry, I do, I do want to move on to make sure we get through all these questions. Uh, Dr. Crabtree. So thank you. Uh, so I'm George Crabtree from Argonne National Lab and also University of Illinois at Chicago, uh, director of the Joint Center for Energy Storage Research. Uh, a lot of our uh, background was actually introduced by uh, Acting Secretary Ponum when he talked about the grid and about cars. They, between the two, control about 70% of the energy we use in this country, 30% uh, for transportation and 40% for the grid. Uh, both are ready for transformation. The car to become electrified, so replace uh, foreign oil with domestic electricity, and perhaps if we uh, generate our electricity from anything other than coal, reduce the carbon emissions. And the grid to deploy at large scale wind and solar, which are variable generation sources, and at 30%, which is quite reasonable and is in fact the government goal, uh, you need something to back them up uh, when the sun doesn't shine on cloudy days or when the wind doesn't blow on, on calm days. So our goal is to change both of these energy sectors by uh, our slogan, which uh, Acting Secretary Poneman mentioned, 555, five times the energy density, one-fifth the cost, do it in five years, and this is what it takes to be transformational. So you could say that's a risky and aggressive goal. Yes, it is. Uh, but that's what it takes if you want to have the big impact that we're looking for. And, uh, and that's what we're going after. I think uh, in view of the time, maybe I'll leave it at that and welcome questions later. Thanks. Thanks. I, I'm Alex King. I'm from the Ames Lab in Ames, Iowa. Uh, sitting amid all these NASA Graphics. I have to explain that that's not the NASA Ames Research Center, which is in California. Neither is it the lab that brought you the Ames strain of anthrax, which was delivered to this building in the mail. That's another lab down the road from us, still in Ames, Iowa. Um, the Ames Lab is a DOE national lab. It focuses strongly on materials. And the Critical Materials Institute has, um, is led by the Ames Lab. It brings together the efforts of four national labs, seven universities, seven leading industrial uh, corporations in the United States. And it's there to solve the problem that these guys are going to create. Um, if you look at the world's supply of materials, it tends to be fairly well regulated. The free market does a good job of ensuring that the world produces about as much steel as it uses every year, about as much aluminum as it uses every year. But every now and again, something gets out of control. And it happens typically when two conditions arise. One is where the supply chain is fragile, usually meaning there's only one source of a material. And even that is not fatal. If that one source can meet the needs, there's not a problem. But when you have one source and then suddenly needs grow because of a transformational technology comes into force, then you get a problem. We had that with the rare earths just a few years ago. The single source was China. And the transformational technology that occurred was actually two. Wind turbines, which use rare earths at the rate of 700 pounds per unit, where before we were using rare earths in earbuds using three or four grams per unit. Um, and also hybrid cars, which use rare earths at about seven pounds per unit. So when demand grows uh, and you have a source fragility, then you have a critical material. I'm looking forward to um, the efforts of all these other guys here, because if George Crabtree creates a new battery and the US decides, the US consumer decides that they all want cars made with that new battery, then if he needs 10 pounds of lithium or magnesium or manganese per car times 300 million cars in the US, we have to be assured that you can increase the production of those materials in time for that technology to, to take hold. If the materials are not there, 
the technology will fail. You can't make it without materials. The strategies are simple. You either, well, the first thing is you have to foresee demand, and that's one of the most important things that the Critical Materials Institute will bring. The second things are when you've foreseen the demand, you either have to increase supply, which means that uh, you start new mines. That takes about 10 years. Or you have to reduce the use, which means you find substitute materials that work just as well, but they're more plentifully available. The track record is that it takes about 18 years to introduce a substitute material. 10 years to increase supply, 18 years to reduce demand. We have a problem. Uh, if any of these guys are successful, uh, they will produce challenges that are very, very hard to meet. At the Critical Materials Institute, we are tasked with foreseeing those problems and developing the technical solutions that will avert them before they happen. Right now, we're working to catch up with the demand for the rare earths, and I'm pretty confident that we can do that. We can make significant inroads within about two years um, and solve the 10-year uh, the problem, the 18-year problem going forward. Uh, but I'm going to be watching my colleagues here like a hawk to see what it is they're coming up with, so, so we try and foresee what comes next. Um, let me just ask a couple of individual questions quickly. Um, uh, I guess we'll start with, with Nate um, and this idea of producing gasoline out of uh, carbon dioxide and water, just using the energy from the sun. Um, I, I've, I've heard, and correct me if I've not got this exactly right, but that that uh, your team has actually uh, developed a, um, yeah, that, that you've modeled and designed and, and built a scalable uh, prototype device that can actually do this. Uh, can, can you tell us a little bit more about that and what it means? Uh, yes, that's actually correct. So this is one of the powers of having the hub concept in place. There are 30 years of individual laboratories one making a catalyst for reducing water to hydrogen, one making a catalyst to oxidize water to oxygen, um, one top finding a material that might absorb sunlight, but they don't all work together, and then you have nothing. They don't all work under the same conditions of pH. They don't add their voltages correctly to make the whole reaction work, just pieces of the reaction. So we initially took a systems level viewpoint of what the requirements were to actually make a system that is safe, that won't make explosive gases, because that's just not a viable technical solution to anything, and um, put together uh, permutations in significantly new ways from old existing systems to demonstrate that this dog can hunt, that this in principle works. Now, those materials are really the beginning, because once you have that prototype, you then can say, well, what really matters here? Where are the levers that I need to pull to have the biggest influence on the new part of the science? I need to discover <coughs> this material that works better, but that's really only 20% leverage. But this stuff, if I make a better light absorber, I can get a factor of two better in performance. So we focus our R&D on the things that matter based on the modeling, the simulation, and the real implementation of building the system uh, so right now we're, uh, like the Wright brothers, we're showing it's possible to fly. And that doesn't mean we built the 747. It just means we know we can get off the ground, and you know, knowing you can do that uh, is arguably more than half the battle because you know, innovation and technology is what our country does better than anybody else, so we'll keep going. And Doug, I understand that, that uh, all of the hubs have uh, you know, the full benefit may be realized over a, a, a longer term uh, period, but uh, that, that one of the sort of near to medium term benefits of, of your work might actually be to get a lot more juice out of uh, our current fleet of reactors without having to even build new reactors. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, sure. Since, since the late 70s, our uh, reactor fleet has extracted about seven gigawatts of power up rates. Um, and that that um, is certainly with the help of modeling and simulation. One and that's, of the, and one, that's one gigawatt is like one reactor, so that's like seven new reactors already. Right. And one of the uh, one of the areas of focus for Castle is to <coughs> impact the, the existing fleet. And um, existing fleet is continually looking for ways to improve performance, improve uh, efficiencies, and 
and part of that is manifested by extracting more power. And so uh, power uprates is, is an area where modeling simulation plays a key role in terms of understanding uh, what changes need to be imparted to the system, how to, how to license that power uprate. And so uh, our virtual envir environment is, um, is focusing on here and now challenges, and one, one really is, uh, is uh, power uprates. So, okay. um, and Alex from the Materials Hub, can you, can you tell us a little bit more about what makes a material critical um, and uh, uh, why this is an, an, an important area to be looking at? Well, material's critical if you need it and you can't get it. It's very simple. Um, nothing very complicated about that at all. But typically, uh, technologies are getting more complicated every day. If you take the cell phone out of your pocket, and I see some of you already have, um, <laughs> you're holding in your hand an exquisitely complicated device that relies specifically on the properties of at least 65 different elements. If we'd been in this room 10 years ago and I'd made the same challenge to you take your cell phone out of your pocket, you'd be looking at a device that required about 20 or 30 different elements only. So technology gets more and more complicated as we go forward. And um, if any one of the materials in your cell phone is no longer available, then your cell phone can't be manufactured. Um, it, you know, the cell phone is an extreme example, but if you go and look at um, lighting, for instance, we're sitting here under fluorescent lights, which is the right way to go for today. They're much more efficient than the incandescence that came before. Um, the Department of Energy is pushing very hard to replace incandescence with fluorescence all over the country. The timeline for doing that has had to be pushed back simply because there is not enough of two elements available to make incandescent lights. They are terbium and europium, which are both rare earth elements. They happen to produce green and red colors um, that help to make the white light. You also need blue, but the blue phosphor is okay. We've got plenty of that. Um, so the production of lamps is actually being constrained right now because we do not have enough rare earth elements. We're not able to move forward fast enough with changing our lighting, which goes into the building technologies, simply because of a lack of uh, materials. And one of the things that the, the Critical Materials Institute will be doing is working on ways of providing more supply for the lamp manufacturers of the world. Excellent. Um, I do want to take an opportunity if there are questions from the audience here. Um, I wanted to just expand on the fact that we also have competition for these materials and that one of our global competitors has gotten almost a monopoly on a lot of these materials, which necessitates us focusing on replacements or uh, making, uh, or creating alternatives. Yeah, thanks. I could lecture for many hours about that, so don't, you know, be careful how you get me started. But yeah, there, there's competition in all sorts of levels. One is for the sources of the materials. Um, for the, the, the last 150 or so years, We've been able to get what materials we needed by going around the world, finding the sources and buying, or in some cases, otherwise obtaining the materials we need. Um, those days are gone. Uh, the countries that produce materials have learned that they can also produce value-added products made from those materials. And it's not only the source of the materials that matters, it's the ability to manufacture using those materials. So manufacturing is increasingly going to the countries that are the sources of materials. And the, you know, the, the big elephant in the room in that regard is, of course, China. China, until a few, couple of years ago, produced 97% of all of the world's rare earths. They used to export rare earth ore for reprocessing elsewhere. They stopped, they stopped exporting ore and started exporting materials. They've stopped exporting materials and are now exporting finished goods. Um, if we want to survive as a manufacturing nation, we need to have assured supplies of our own materials. So it's not only competition for the materials, it's competition for the entire manufacturing se sector that we're looking at here. Other questions from the audience? Sure, I'm happy to do that. 
to what, what he's referring to is that one of the concepts that the hubs with its longer timeline and more ability to devote resources can allow us to do is to just think about doing things in ways that you couldn't even think about them before. So one of the goals of our hub was to find ways to replace our critical materials that were catalysts, platinum and ruthenium dioxide, with cheaper materials that would be more abundant and easier to use. So on the other hand, fuel cells have the same issue, and we've discovered less than five new catalysts in the past century. And we said if we do the same argumentation line of business, the odds of us discovering the next five in the next century weren't any higher than before. So instead, we uh, developed methods and protocols to screen and quantify the activity of a million new catalysts every single day. Uh, that was our goal. We're, we're basically doing that. Uh, we've demonstrated we can do that. Uh, we're automating that now. We do it with inkjet printers and with physical vapor deposition, where we combine any combination of inks to make new elements and make new materials. We then heat them up and then transform them into various new phases. We then screen them with laser scanners to find out what color they are. We screen them with uh, new tools to develop how active they are as catalysts. And then we put them all into a database. And any good idea will be pursued along with a million of its nearest neighbors the next day from any lab around the world by just giving us a job that we'll submit. Uh, not only is this important for our hub, uh, but it opens up a new way of doing business in the sense that there are other catalysts for refining, for fuel cell technology, for batteries uh, that also should be discovered every five milliseconds instead of every five years. And so the R&D that we develop under this hub can reach across not only the other hubs, but across the R&D effort in energy technology. And so again, the hub enables you to think in this different way to establish these capabilities that would be beyond the scope of an individual laboratory or an energy frontier research center and to leverage our capabilities to enable things that we would just never dream of being able to do before. I'm happy to give you more technical details on this, uh, but that's the vision and the implementation. So we've got just a few minutes left, so we're going to move to the lightning round. Um, uh, let me let me start um, with uh, uh, Dr. Foley from the Buildings Hub. Um, can you can you give us a, a uh, another minute on the on the question of of how a building works together as a system, as opposed to the individual components being more efficient appliances? Yeah, if you think about a building and uh, an actual building as opposed to some sort of idealized form of a building, uh, there are lots of non-ideal aspects to it. One is the fact that uh, it never reaches a true, what we would call, steady state, right? The conditions outside of the building, radiance, temperature, uh, precipitation, change uh, fairly frequently. Uh, and yet the time constants for change in the building are all very different. So the, the envelope structure has time constants that are very slow depending on the materials. Uh, the time constants for air uh, can turn over in a room may be relatively fast. Obviously lights go on and off instantaneously. Whenever you have systems where you have that sort of bandwidth of time constants, orders and orders of magnitude between them, then you get these sort of nonlinear complex phenomena. And that is exactly what's happening in buildings. How many of you have ever been in a room where you've really been comfortable when you have 30 or 40 other people around? It's very hard to do. As trivial as it sounds, it's very hard to control these kinds of spaces. In addition, then we put these obnoxious peripherals in the building called people. And people start to do things like open the windows, walk around, some are hotter than others. And so when you tie all these pieces together, it makes it very difficult. In addition, what we also find is then that um, when people are trying to operate these buildings, it's a bit like trying to operate your shower in the morning with a, with a rather imprecise control system. First you try to get it just about right and it's too hot, then you push it back over this way and it's too cold. Well, that's pretty much how we find uh, buildings are operated. The control systems are really very, very primitive. What it means is we need much more distributed control, we need much more sensing 
around the buildings. We've created one of the most highly instrumented buildings in the world right now in Building 101 in the Navy Yard for that very purpose, going back to databases. Uh, we're creating a database and databases from 6,500 commercial buildings right now to really understand these phenomena in ways that we haven't understood them before. So theory tells us, yeah, we understand why buildings do this, but we need a tremendous amount of data to really be able to fill out our models, our simulations, and be able to show why those specific buildings interact the way they do. So it's a complicated process. It's a big engineering science problem, and there's been a paucity of data. And um, uh, a question for Dr. Dr. Crabtree. Um, I understand that, that you've made progress on a, a flow battery for uh, renewable energy sources. Can you uh, decode that for us? Sure. So one of the uh, many ideas, this one, yeah. One of the ideas that uh, we're uh, pursuing is to replace the solid electrodes, the anode and cathode of a battery, with liquids. So if you're restricted with uh, a, a working ion and a solid structure that it has to be compatible with, it limits the, the, uh, the range, the number of materials that you can consider. If you make the uh, electrode a liquid, so a solution or a suspension, suddenly a lot of the restrictions are off and the space of materials that you could consider is much bigger. So one of the things that we've done in the last three months, and I should point out we got our funding in the middle of December, which I think is a record for uh, the Office of Science. Within two weeks of the announcement, we were at, our money was flowing and we were working, uh, is to explore this space and actually come up with a set of new organic uh, materials that can form liquid cathodes uh, store lots of energy for the grid, so you pump these liquids into big tanks out in a field somewhere. Uh, the footprint doesn't matter. It's the cost that matters. And the point with the organics is that, indeed, they can be made very, very cheaply. And we hope that this is one of the routes that will be successful uh, in achieving our second five, which is one-fifth the cost. Terrific. All right, the final question, and we'll ask each of you to respond in 30 seconds or less, because we have 30 seconds or less. Um, so. This is Natalie Rose. She's nine months old. She's the cutest baby in America. Um, when, when she turns uh, 22 and she's graduated from college, if your research has been successful, how will her world be different? And whoever wants to tackle that first. I'll just start briefly. I have even less than 30 seconds. She'll be driving an electric car. The power for that car will be produced by, primarily by wind and solar, so there won't be any carbon emissions, and that will be a tremendous step forward in, in controlling and stabilizing our climate. I think she'll be driving my used car. <laughs> in addition, the building that she'll be working in will be highly efficient. It'll be uh, much healthier. Uh, the home that she lives in will be much more efficient and healthier. It'll be tied to a grid that will be much smarter, and maybe even the cars will be part of that grid. So it would be a very different world. The, the plane that she flies in, the trucks that deliver the supplies and food to support commerce, the ships that um, move our goods around will all be running on clean, sustainable, homegrown fuel that doesn't deleteriously affect our climate and that we don't have to import from other countries, but we can grow it ourselves in a sustainable way. There'll be uh, new advanced and uh, probably much smaller reactors, uh, potentially just in our neighborhood, down the street, powering local neighborhoods. And all of those things will be enabled by materials <laughs> generated, created, uh, found in the United States and, and turned into products that people buy through manufacturing in the United States. Well, that's terrific. Thank you all, uh, and, and thanks uh, to the audience for, for coming here. Um, we're finishing right on time, uh, so we really appreciate it. And uh, I, I know the, the hub directors have to get to a bunch of meetings, but I'm sure that if somebody's got an individual question, you might be able to catch them on the way out. Thank you.